Hey Happy Friday! This week I spent some time with Intel's brand new Panther Lake CPUs, we solved the mystery about Meta's smart glasses, and the Alt Store Pal actually became a viable alternative to the Apple App Store apparently. Timestamps are below as usual, and welcome to the Friday Checkout. This video was sponsored by Brilliant. Okay, for my first story of the week, I was in Arizona recently, where Intel has just launched their next-generation laptop chip family codenamed Panther Lake, and let's just say I'm cautiously optimistic. So would the last generation Intel actually split its mainstream laptop line into two completely separate paths? On the thin and light end, you had Lunar Lake, hyper-optimized for efficiency, while on the more powerful end, you had Arrow Lake, which went more for performance and higher core counts. But this year, Intel with Panther Lake is returning to just having one series that scales all the way. There are three different configurations, but the only real difference between them is their CPU and their GPU core counts. Intel claims that they would somehow still beat Lunar Lake on efficiency by 10%, and also the higher end Arrow Lake by something like 40%, while at the same time also offering significantly more cores and more power again. So theoretically, the best of both worlds due to optimizations like having better efficiency cores that require the computer to wake up the higher performance cores less often, and also due to Intel finally having a new manufacturing process called Intel 18A. Specifically, the biggest part of the chip called the compute tile that houses the CPU is finally made in-house by Intel again, and they used 18A. Intel actually took us into their fab and showed us around, which was very cool, but I was sadly not allowed to film anything there. So I'll just have to tell you that they claim to have two big manufacturing innovations. First is RibbonFET, which is a new way to make transistors. And second is PowerVIA, which means Intel for the first time ever could separate power delivery and signal routing to two different sides of the chip. These are industry first, and without getting too nerdy, all of that should mean a better power efficiency and more performance, and it's good to see that Intel actually got this process out of the door. Meanwhile, especially promising seem to be the new integrated GPUs, which are called XE3. In the high-end model, these promise a very respectable 50% increase in peak performance over the already capable Lunar Lake, and I've seen some AAA gaming demos that ran really well on thin laptops both natively and also with Intel's new AI tricks, such as their newly introduced multi-frame generation. Without AI, that game is running at like 50-60 FPS, while with AI, it's over 200. Pretty good. Now, I have to point out that many of the graphs we received from Intel were extra confusing. There are, of course, no labels on the graphs as Apple has innovated recently, but also you didn't know exactly which SKU they were comparing with which exact chip from the past. So, you know, take everything with a grain of salt. But yeah, overall, things look promising. Okay, for my second story of the week, you probably know that smart glasses and optics in general are one of my favorite topics on the internet, and iFixit actually solved one of the biggest mysteries of the smart glass universe this week. You've probably seen videos of the new Meta Ray-Bans with displays already, which are undoubtedly a whole generation ahead of their competition. But meanwhile, the most interesting innovation is obviously Meta's new waveguide system. Unlike with other glasses where you can see these green and blue shimmers everywhere from both the display and the external reflections, the Meta glasses barely seem to have any glow at all, and reviewers also say that the image is much brighter and clearer than usual. And this week, the iFixit teardown confirmed what I guessed but didn't know for sure. Instead of something called a diffractive waveguide, they used a geometric waveguide, almost certainly from a company called Lumos. This company places little semi-transparent mirrors inside the glass that bounce the light around way more efficiently. And if you compare the Lumos promo materials with videos of Meta, you can clearly see the angled lines over here, and then another set of vertical lines here, while on the Meta glasses you can see the angles right here, and in a clip from Marquez I also found the vertical lines again, which again confirms that Meta likely used a more refined version of the same tech. Now, this is great news because, as far as I know, Lumos is a standards part supplier that anyone can buy components from, so unless Meta has some exclusive deal, this technology will likely become common for the industry. Also, iFixit shows that the projector itself is a fairly standard LCOS unit as well. None of this is particularly expensive, so ideally, in a year or two, we'll have many competing glasses with similar display qualities that will not require you to invite Zuckerberg into your life 24-7. Because while the tech is cool, I'd personally never put a Meta product anywhere near my face long term. Fun fact, in my super deep dive video about smart glass technology, I picked out Lumos as having the most interesting technology in waveguides, and I also predicted many other things that have come true since, so if you're into smart glasses technologies, I recommend you watch that video next. Okay, and for my third story of the week, I thought the alternatives to the Apple App Store were really, really niche, but apparently I was wrong. 
Remember Alt Store Pal? Because of EU regulations, you can install this app store here and download apps that Apple would be picky about, like game emulators or even a porn app called Hot Tub. Well, they just raised $6 million. They announced that they're expanding to Australia, Brazil, and Japan this year, with more to come as other markets are forcing similar regulations. And they say that they now have hundreds of thousands of users and 100 developers or so with apps on the store, including even big names like Epic Games coming. Oh, and this is fun and odd. As of this week, they're also now part of the Fed Fediverse with a built-in ActivityPub integration. This means that you can use a Fediverse account like Mastodon or Threads and then use that to subscribe to an app from their app store and see their updates as posts in your feed and comment on them which would presumably show up in the app store as normal comments. Turning an app store into a social experience is pretty weird but cool. And clearly AltStorePal is still a niche product but it's significantly less niche than I thought and we might see some expansion soon. Cool. Okay, and moving on to our release monitor, we only have a single product this week, which is this odd little guy called the HMD Touch 4G. The company calls this a hybrid phone, it's basically a feature phone and a smartphone combined. You get a touchscreen that runs something other than regular Android with some basic apps, but no more, and it's selling in India for the equivalent of about $45. Weird, but okay. And then moving on to the brief, we'll start with Synology, who announced that they will backtrack on their previous decision of locking certain features to their own hard drives, and that going forward, third-party drives will be supported again in their newer models. It only took many customers boycotting them to walk back on their decision. Great job! And talking of unpopular updates, Microsoft decided to delay its recently announced massive Xbox Game Pass Ultimate price hikes, specifically for customers in countries like Germany, Ireland, South Korea, Poland, and India. Customers in select markets will get more time and the opportunity to cancel their subscription before Microsoft raises prices due to regulations in those countries giving consumers stronger protections. It sounds like that should be a global standard, but okay. And in more news that will definitely make Microsoft very popular, the company is also removing some known workarounds that let you create a local account during Windows 11 setup, and the company is instead forcing everyone to use a Microsoft account instead. Just trust the company with your data, man. What could go wrong? <laughs> Meanwhile, in a demonstration of what could actually go wrong, a breach related to Discord apparently led to 70,000 users potentially having their government IDs leaked. Specifically, a third-party service provider that they used to support their customer service efforts to review age-related appeals was breached. Oh yeah, maybe that is actually a good reason to avoid giving companies your data whenever you could, because either them or one of the gajillion service providers that they also give your data to will eventually lose it. Oops. And next, in other controversial updates, the popular free audio editing software called Audacity got a teaser for a massive update called Audacity 4, which completely overhauls things and also adds a ton of new features and refinements. I've left a really long and entertaining video about it in the description. But sadly, most of the attention on the internet seems to have focused on the logo being simplified too much instead. Now, I'm a little bit biased because I'm friends with Martin from Tentacruel, who is in charge of this redesign, and I have to say, I don't love the new logo even like that. But seriously, this, this is a logo that people are nostalgic for and want to keep. You can't be right. Anyway, and then in also entirely predictable news, Deloitte, one of the world's largest consulting firms, had to offer a refund for an error-ridden Australian government report that they used AI for. The report, quote, contained multiple errors, including references and citations, to non-existent reports. But hey, it's just your government spending your tax money on this. But worry not, Deloitte said that they're still going all in on AI, despite what happened. Because of course they are. Meanwhile, in more AI news, OpenAI also announced that they will deploy a massive amount of AMD GPUs to complement their NVIDIA stack. And this, of course, sent AMD stock absolutely through the roof. And still with OpenAI, the company also announced that they're rolling out apps in ChatGPT. For now, the selection is pretty small and functionality seems limited too, but essentially you can just write out the name of the service that you want something from and just tell it what you want from it and it should automatically do the thing. That actually seems fairly useful for once and presumably it requires app makers to voluntarily build some integrations for it, so it probably doesn't even violate anyone's rights for a change, I think. An unusual thing for an AI. And meanwhile, in big news for chips, Arduino announced that it is joining Qualcomm as it's been acquired by the company. Arduino is one of the leading makers of single board computers and right away they also announced launching a brand new device that for the first time will feature a Qualcomm chip on it. Let's see how this acquisition goes. 
Developer boards like these are a great way to learn how hardware and software actually work and also work together. But if you want to start with the actual fundamentals, I really recommend a class called Digital Circuits from my sponsor, Brilliant. They start with really simple concepts like how binary numbers, the ones and zeros work, and then they move on to breaking down how logic gates work, which are the fundamental building blocks inside your processor. And they continue to build concept by concept toward you actually properly understanding the fundamentals. And you don't get to just passively watch a video on this, but instead you actually get to practice each learning with interactive exercises to make sure that you really understand each step. This interactive method is not only extremely effective for learning, but it's also just way more fun than just sitting through a lecture. Brilliant, of course, has courses on many other topics from engineering to science, maths, biology, and more. And if you like computer science, I think their classes on AI and large language models will be especially interesting for you. To try Brilliant for free, visit brilliant.org TFC or scan the QR code on screen, or you can also click on the link in the description. If you do so, you'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. So happy learning, and I'll see you next Friday. Bye.